Hi, this is Frankie, and today I have an amazing video for you. Have you ever wondered what the process is like from the time that you arrive at a place where you're going to have surgery, where you're meeting with your surgeon, your anesthesia provider, and finally go to sleep in the operating room? Well, on this video, I'm actually going to show you every step of the way, and I'll be narrating from a patient that I did surgery on a few months ago. She was kind enough to let me do this, and we're going to go through every single step, and I'll be explaining what's happening throughout and up to the time that she finally is asleep in the operating room. You're not going to want to miss this, so follow along. So here I'm coming in, and um, I'm, I've already had... Uh, looked over her chart, and I already know all her past medical history. But while I start the IV, which is what was in my hands, um, I have the IV line there that I'm about to start. I'm going to go over all of her history again. So what's going on is that I want to confirm that all the information that I gathered from her primary care physician that gave her clearance for this procedure and from the information from her labs that everything is uh, correct. And obviously also uh, identifying her, uh, asking her her name, her date of birth. So patient identifiers for me to be sure that what I read, the chart that I went through was actually this patient. So at this point here, I'm, uh, I'm about to get started on starting her IV. So I usually get all my stuff prepared I leave my tegaderm ready. I already have my tourniquet on her arm, and I just swabbed her hand with some um, alcohol to clean her skin. And that's a 20 gauge needle that I'm going to insert. And as you can see, I carefully insert it at about a 45 degree to angle, and then I go down uh, in order to thread that catheter in. As you can see, the actual needle doesn't stay in the patient. What stays in the patient is that little plastic nylon that will stay there the whole time in her vein. Now I'm connecting the IV tubing and through that IV tubing, I'll be able to deliver continuously fluids throughout the procedure and also give her medications uh, in the beginning of the case. So now I'm just securing it with some Tegaderm, which is that transparent tape dressing over her hand. And I'm going to also put some extra tape there uh, in order to secure it in place. Uh, one of the things what I'm doing right now is I'm actually talking to her. I'm asking her about her uh, medication list, if she has any allergies to any medications, surgeries that she's had in the past, which in her case, she, she had surgery in the past. So she has been exposed to anesthesia before. So I'm going over all that information, her uh, respiratory system, cardiovascular, if she has any history whatsoever, uh, just to make sure that everything is um, the same as I noted on the chart itself. So now we headed into, we left the pre-op area and I'm laying her down in the operating bed. So as she lies down, I'm going to hang my IV bag and uh, position her. So positioning is very important. I have her uh, come up in the bed a little bit there, and uh, I'm going to place her arms to the side on the arm boards. So the patient's arms are usually positioned on the arm board throughout the whole procedure. And now I am applying the monitors. So first, usually I apply the blood pressure cuff. And the reason that I apply the blood pressure cuff first is that it has to cycle. So I'm going to go ahead and as soon as I get that blood pressure cuff, and I'm already getting the pulse oximeter on, which measures her oxygen saturation. I'm hitting, uh, it's a start cycling on the monitor here. So it's gonna start squeezing her arm to get that blood pressure reading. And while I'm doing that, now I'm going to go in with the leads. And this is gonna give me um, the EKG for me to be able to follow the electrical um, rate and her rhythm that I'll be able to see in the monitor. So I'm applying a three lead EKG. There are sometimes you can use a five lead EKG, but she's a very healthy patient um, and we don't need a five lead on her and that'll actually get more in the way. So since she doesn't need it, I'll use a three lead EKG. So I'm applying the EKGs and uh, I have her nice and comfortable. I'm talking to her. A lot of times I'm talking about, you know, um, personal things uh, in order to just minimize a little bit of the patient's anxiety. 
and I'm starting to draw my meds. So first I'm draw drawing a little bit of lidocaine 1%, so usually three or four cc's. And the reason I do that is because that this is the syringe I'm gonna be using for, for propofol. And that is the medication that is gonna induce the anesthesia and put her to sleep. And the reason I put some lidocaine in there is that it minimizes a little bit of the burn. So propofol is one of those medications, a little caustic, and sometimes when you're injecting it, into the patient, and I'm going to inject it through that IV line that I started uh, previously, is it causes a little mild burning. So I try to put the lidocaine in to, you know, to minimize that. And that right there is a muscle relaxant called rocuronium. So I'm actually using the label that comes usually on the actual vial uh, to identify that medication. And now that I have those drugs all drawn up uh, and positioned next to the patient, I'm going to start and increase my flows on me at my anesthesia machine. And I am going to go ahead and apply that mask over the patient's face. And what usually I do is this is called pre-oxygenation. So what I'm doing is I'm asking her to take some nice deep breaths and I want to remove as much nitrogen uh, from her lungs and try to get it at to 100% oxygen. And by having her take three or five nice deep breaths, I accomplish this. And what I want is for her to have more oxygen on board because from the time that I induce the anesthesia itself uh, that I'm about to do now uh, to the time that I finally secure her airway, which is for me to actually put that tube in, uh, what happens is she's not breathing. So if I had delivered, as I did, uh, the oxygen previously, um, 100% oxygen, she'll have more time that she can be without breathing before her saturation, her oxygen saturation starts coming down. So I've gone ahead and injected the propofol and injected the muscle relaxant. I usually inject both unless I foresee that the patient's at risk for a very difficult airway. And I'm having her breathe as she's slowly falling into sleep. And you can see that her eyes is just kind of closing. So even though her eyes did not shut completely, she's, she's out. So she's completely asleep. So now I'm going to take over her breathing. I sealed my mask over her face, and I'm starting to give her breaths with the actual um, bag. So I'm actually just breathing pure oxygen into her right now. So now she's not breathing on her own, and she depends on me 100% for her to breathe. So what I have to do now is I grab my laryngoscope and an endotracheal tube. And I usually do not use stylets uh, with my endotracheal tube. And for those of you who know what a stylet is, it's a metal tube that would go inside that endotracheal tube, that plastic PVC tube right there that I'm going to use to secure her airway uh, that helps us with the in intubation. But I finally, I find it that it's a little too fidgety and I actually prefer to not use a stylet and I've been practicing like this for many, many years and uh, I don't use a stylet and I've, I don't see the necessity. So right now I'm actually trying to, she was a little bit more anterior than I, than I imagined and obviously I'm having a little bit of difficulty there just getting a tube in the right spot, but it's in. And the laryngoscope comes out nice and carefully. And the first thing I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go ahead and inflate the cuff. So at the tip of the cuff of that endotracheal tube, there was a balloon. And by inflating it, I seal it off. And that anything, for example, if she were to regurgitate at this point, uh, anything that would be in her stomach would not get into her lungs. So that we call this a secured airway. I've gone ahead and put my circuit, uh, attached my circuit to the actual endotracheal tube, and I checked placement, which I already have at this point, and I turned on my ventilator. And right now here, I'm actually setting my ventilator settings. So how many breaths I want her to take per minute, um, the volume of the breaths, and right now I'm adjusting the flow of oxygen, nitrous, and that right there that I'm turning on is the actual anesthesia gas. So the propofol was used just to put her to sleep, but the anesthesia gas that she's breathing in mixed with oxygen is what's keeping her asleep. So I've gone ahead and secured her eyes with tape and a pro tip, uh, it's not very good to do your lashes before you come in to do a procedure because 
we usually have to secure your eyes with tape. And a lot of times we end up removing that tape and uh, the lashes actually. And um, now I secured the tube with some tape also making sure all my connections to the tube because obviously she needs that to breathe. And I'm making sure that the tube is nice and connected. Everything is correct. Her vital signs are fine. And that is she's stable for surgery. So now they're going to start prepping and Dr. William will start performing the surgery. Um, so I hope you guys really enjoyed this, of the process of how you go from completely being awake and pre-op and having a conversation with me and going over your history to the point where you're actually in the operating room and you finally go to sleep. You actually go to sleep very fast once I inject that medication, that propofol, that milky white substance. And then uh, that's where my time starts where I have to get that tube in you as fast as possible to be able to breathe for you throughout the procedure and deliver those and that anesthesia gas that is vital for you staying asleep throughout the whole procedure. At the end, the only thing I do is I turn off the anesthesia gas and as you start breathing on your own, coming back and actually breathing that anesthesia gas out, you start waking yourself up. So usually there's really no medication that I give to reverse the anesthetic. I might give a medication to reverse the muscle relaxant, which is that medication to relax your muscle. So depending on how long it's been since I've given you that medication, I will or will not have to give you something to reverse it. But the actual sedation, what's keeping you asleep throughout the whole procedure, all I do is I turn it off. And as you breathe it out, you start waking up. So I hope you like this video and if you have any comments about what you just saw here or any video ideas that you'd like to share with me, just comment down below and don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.